Today we're going to read a, one of my favorite passages from the De Bello Gallico, the chronicles of the wars experienced and written by Julius Caesar himself. Noble ones, what a pleasure. Welcome back. Now you see, um, I've chosen these specific passages where we will read the deeds of some centurions. Now the reason why I've chosen this is because, well, centurions rule, they're really cool, and uh, I really like the things that are said, and I think it's interesting not only because it sounds good, like I really like this, the sound of certain words put together in this, in this passage, but also um, it's interesting the, the situation that is happening. So for, what we're going to do now is that I'm going to read it in Latin, I'm going to use classical Latin pronunciation, but please keep in mind that the pronunciation I use, yes, it is classical, so it's definitely not ecclesiastical, but um, sometimes I make choices. So I know, for example, th there is a book that has been pointed out to me, and it's the book Vox Latina. I own that book, so I am aware of what that book says, and I think it's a fantastic read, and I will make a dedicated video on that book. But the fact that I think it's an excellent book doesn't mean that I agree 100% with everything, uh, everything the book says and everything scholars say, because please keep in mind, the, the classical pronunciation is a reconstructed pronunciation, and therefore you can't be 100% sure of every single element. Of many, we do have literary sources, and they can be backed up to a quite solid position, but still, I have my own opinion and my own interpretation, so this reading will be based on classical pronunciation, but my own uh, approach to classical pronunciation. So let's read. Erant in ea legione fortissimi viri, centuriones, cui iam primis ordinibus, ad propinquarent, Titus Pullo et Lucius Vorenus, qui perpetuas inter se controversias habebant uter alteri ante ferretur, omnibusque annis de loco summis simultatibus contendebant. Ex his Pullo cum acerrime ad munitiones pugnaretur. Quid dubitas inquit, Vorene, autquem locum tuae probandae virtutis expectas? Hic dies, de nostris controversis judicabit. Haec cum dixiset, procedit extra munitiones, quaque hostium pars confertissima est visa inrumpit. Ne vorenus, quidem seset um vallo continent, sed omnium veritus existimationem subsequitur. Mediocris patio relicto pullo pilum in hostes inmitit, atque unum ex multitudine procurrentem traicit, quo percusso ex animatoque hunc scutis protegunt hostes. In illum universi tela coniciunt, neque dant progrediendi facultatem, trasvigitur scutum pulloni et verutum in balteo defigitur, avertit hic casus vaginam et gladium educere, conanti dextram moratur, manum impeditunque, hostes circumsistunt, succurrit inimicus, illi vorenus et laboranti subvenit, ad hunc se confestim a pullone omnis multitudo convertit, illum veruto transfixum arbitrantur. Vorenus gladio rem comminus cerit atque uno interfecto reliquos paulum propellit, dum cupidius instat, in locum inferiorem deictus concidit, huic rursus circumvento, subsidium fert pullo, atque ambo incolumes com pluribus interfectis summa cum laude, intra munitiones se recipiunt. Sic fortuna in contentione et certamine utrumque versavit, ut alter alteri inimicus auxilio salutique esset neque ti judicari posset. Utri virtute ante ferendus videretur. In that legion there were two very courageous men serving as centurions, Titus Pullo and Lucius Vorenus who were rival commanders. These men were constantly competing between each other to determine which of them was best 
and every year they strove bitterly with one another for the highest honors. Once, when Pudlo was fighting fiercely near the fortification, he shouted, What are you waiting for, Warenus? Or are you awaiting some other opportunity to prove your courage? This day will determine our dispute. After he said this, he advanced outside the camp fortifications and rushed against that section of the enemy that appeared to be most crammed together. Warenus did not remain inside the rampart, fearing the opinion of all the others he chased after. A small space having been left open, Pullo launched his javelin into the enemy host and struck down one of the enemy who was charging at him. While that man had been slain by the blow, the enemy protected this man with their shields, and altogether they hurled their spears at Pullo to prevent his advance. Pullo's shield was transfixed and a javelin struck in his belt. The javelin bent his scabbard and prevented his right hand from trying to remove his sword. As the enemy surrounded the hindered soldier, the rival Warenus hastened to help and relieve his struggling companion. The entire enemy multitude immediately willed from Pullo to Warenus, who was fighting ferociously hand to hand with his sword, and having killed one, he pushed the others back a little. Then, pressing his advantage a little too eagerly, he stumbled and fell down an embankment. Pullo then came to the rescue of the surrounded Warenus, and, after having killed many enemies, they both returned safely within the walls of the camp to the highest praises. Thus, fortune dealt with the two in effort and in battle, that these rivals were each other's salvation, nor was it possible to decide which of the two excelled the other. Okay, well I hope that you enjoyed that. Now, first question, um, the situation that happens, the combat situation and the uh, honorable rivalry of these two centurions is very, very interesting. But did it really happen? And if it did, did it really happen exactly that way? Well, with reading this, just like with other things and other, and other information that we, gain, we get from the De Bello Gallico, I would say that we need to uh, you know, approach this with a little bit of a pinch of salt, if you will. Because it does sound a bit romanticized. And I believe it was. But of course, it doesn't mean it never happened. I believe it did. I imagine that what Caesar says is what happened. But remember, it's what happened through his eyes. And it's also happened through the eyes of a general. What this means is that if the general wanted to see that, I'm sure he did, okay? And if he wanted to emphasize the courage and honor of his men, he would have. Because at the end of the day, who could go against him? Who could say, Kaiser, that's not exactly what happened. Actually, the second centurion didn't give a shit about his, the other guy, and it just happened that he saved him because the guys were going to kill him. I don't think anyone could say that to a gentle Roman general, particularly if you were a member of the army. And of course you were, and you would be the only person who could, you know, say to Kaiser, uh, Sir, that's not exactly what happened, because you would be the only one who has experienced that together with the general. So, um... Does this mean that we shouldn't uh, read the De Bello Gallico? Absolutely not. It's interesting. It also gives us perspective on the point of view of a man who was a Roman and a Roman general at that, and a man who was a very important politician. It helps us understand the way the Romans thought, the way they wanted people to think of them. So it does bring us a lot of very important um, anthropological information. As far as historical accuracy, I would say probably the events unfold in a slightly different way but it probably did happen that situation did happen but this is the information we see also there were many other things that happened during those battles that are described in the the bello gallico that even kaiser himself wouldn't know because he didn't experience of course he did not have an a, an overall view of, of everything and of course he just selected certain things that he thought were important for the things he was writing the De Bello Gallico still is one of my favorite um, pieces of, of literature, of course, uh, having to do with the, with the Romans, but for many reasons, not just because I consider it to be a perfect account, because I don't, but I think it's an interesting account that 
for sure. And a similar situation we could say about Vegetius, for example. Vegetius um, says things from his own point of view, but he wasn't in the military. So the things he says, although they're very important, and I often cite Vegetius in my works, uh, particularly here on YouTube, uh, still uh, his information, again, you need to be careful um, how much credit uh, to give to the man, because, you know, the, the, his form was writing, absolutely beautiful, I personally, that's just my personal opinion, of course, but um, it's still a man who is talking about the times of the Republic, but he's not in the Republic, okay? So he's talking about uh, quite a lot of time, you know, a long time before, so some of the information he's giving is hearsay, probably. We can't be 100% sure how much he could understand of military, of the military not being in the military himself. Still, uh, sometimes I also back up and sort of defend Wegetius by saying that, you know, how difficult would it be for a man of his status to just, you know, sit down for lunch with a few lunches with a actual general and talk with him about these things. So I think we shouldn't completely consider it unreliable and unreliable source only because he wasn't in the military, because I'm sure he could gain, he could have access to first-hand information, the question is, did he? And that is what we don't know. And that is why we should consider the possibility that some of the things he says, when they sound a bit strange, uh, we need to be a bit careful, perhaps. Alright, well, I hope that you enjoyed this video. Then if you did, please remember thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. Also, let me know if you liked my light and reading, and if you liked my choice of passage. If you wish me to read more and comment more on the De Bello Gallico, please let me know in the comments below. And remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Valete!